In this program, I want to take a particular look at how the colors are formed in these uh, transition metal complexes. Many of you are familiar with copper sulfate solutions. They tend to have this blue color associated with them. And that's primarily due to the form of this copper 2 plus ion. Let's begin by looking at its electron configuration at the highest energy level in particular. So you might recall this is the 4s and the 3d. In the copper plus 2 ion, this orbital has been vacated and I have nine electrons located in the 3d. This is one of the first criteria that's required to create a colored solution, partially filled d orbitals. The next criteria that needs to be met is that this substance must bond with a ligand. The ligand is responsible for taking the d orbitals and splitting them. What I mean by that is those five orbitals would now perhaps split with the last ones now being at somewhat of a higher energy level and the first three at a lower energy level. So now the electrons would need to redistribute themselves, some moving up here and some moving down here. So we would get a new distribution of electrons, which I'll show here in red. And again, this is caused by a splitting of the D-level orbitals, which happens because of a ligand. Now here we can see some of the factors that affect this split. Over here we can take a look at the energy of the ligand. If I tend to use things like iodine, bromine, and sulfur, I tend to get very small energy differences between these two values. So the change in energy here would be very small. Conversely, if I tend to use these ligands, I get a much larger split. So the nature of the ligand can affect this split. And there are some other factors that can affect this split, which I'll list here. So the metal ion itself, whether I'm using iron or copper or vanadium, they all can have some effect. The charge on the ion, generally if the charge goes up, the change in energy between these two levels will also go up. As I mentioned, the ligand can have some effect, and those effects are seen down here. And finally, the geometry of the complex ion. Is it linear, square, tetrahedral, and so forth? Anyway, once I'd split these d energy electrons, the final criteria is then when my electron transitions or moves. So if I have an electron down here that transitions or moves up to here, it's capable of absorbing a certain wavelength of light. Now let's take a little bit more closer look at what happens with that transition in the copper. So as I mentioned, I have my D level split. So I have some of my D orbits here and some of my D orbits here. And when my electron from here moves up to here, so we have a change in energy associated with that, that change in energy is given by this equation, which we saw in an earlier unit. You can see from this equation that as this energy gap goes up, and to keep this quantity equal, the wavelength of light must um, go down correspondingly. So we tend to move towards smaller and smaller wavelengths of light, which would mean things like um, our ultraviolet or violet or blue end of the spectrum. Now in the case of our copper solution, this energy gap corresponds to wavelengths of light that tend to lie in the orange part of the spectrum. 
So these are the colors that are removed. So when we shine white light in on our sample of, of a copper sulfate solution, the spectrum of colors come out with the orange missing. This is removed or absorbed to help promote our electron up. With that color removed, what we see then are the remaining parts of the spectrum all blended together, and that would create a blue color, the complementary color to orange. So that brings us to our end of chapter 13. In our next unit, we'll take a look more in depth at bonding. Thanks for watching.